The world has gone insane. Cosplayers rule the conventions. Gamers dominate the tabletop and the internet. Sci-fi subjugates the movies and fantasy rules the bookstore with an iron fist. Only one group can bring order to this unruly mob. A team of uber geeks, masters of the nerdly arts, trained for decades in the hobby shops and basements of the nation. Mobilized by the secret masters, they are the Department of Nerdly Affairs. Hello, and welcome to the Department of Nerdly Affairs. I'm your host, Rob Patterson, here with my co-host, Don Chisholm. So tonight, I thought we'd talk about uh, speculators. Yeah. Because speculators are evil, uh, or, or, or maybe they're a necessary evil. I mean, I can see some actual good that speculators do. See, I can maybe think where you're getting at, but, I, but I'd have to overall disagree. Okay, well, here, can I tell you a story? Okay. It's story time with Rob. Woohoo! Everyone gather around, so gather your children around, and I'm going to tell a little story. So when Rob was a little one, back in the 1970s, Rob discovered comic books. And Rob started collecting comic books, you know, going down and mostly buying them from the 5 and 10 cent bin, because they were that cheap back then, folks. <laughs> and I would buy as many of them as my allowance would allow, and I loved my comic books. But the thing is, as a, as a kid who collected comic books, while my friends generally liked comic books, I did notice that society in general did not respect comic books very much. They didn't really think much about comic books. And as I got older, I learned to kind of stay a little quiet on the whole, you know, I'm a comic book collector kind of thing. Even though I loved my collection, I loved reading them, I loved buying more whenever I could. But... Generally speaking, except for my small circle of somewhat nerdly friends, I didn't talk much about it because, you know, I thought I'd be ridiculed. Then, in my, we'll say, grade 10 year, somewhere around grade 10 or so, an amazing thing happened. Comic books suddenly became valuable, kids. Comic books actually became something that were a big social phenomenon, and collecting comic books actually became cool. And socially accepted because someone had discovered that comic books, especially old ones, could be worth a whole lot of money. And so because of that speculation market that existed, suddenly collecting comic books were cool and my geeky hobby was being much more accepted. And in fact, I even had like the cool kids in school actually trying to talk comic books with me all of a sudden. And that was respect and something that I'd never had before. It really brought my hobby into the forefront. And so that's why, when it comes to speculators, I don't mind them, because I think in a lot of ways they help drag some of the nerdly arts into the mainstream in ways that can actually be positive for our hobby. Okay, that's the end of my story time, and why I don't mind speculators that much. Okay, now, <laughs> you're turned on, rip them apart. I was going to say, and here's why you're totally wrong. You're not totally Okay, wrong. tell me why I'm totally wrong. It's not totally, but to go back to the, to the good old days of my misspent youth, I, too, mm -hmm. was a fan of comics, but right? I tended to prefer the undergrounds, uh, the imports. I used to get mine at the bookstores because I'd buy the compilations from out of Europe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what had happened was, you're right that, that comics weren't real popular. And there was an implosion in the mid-70s that, mm -hmm. that for what we'd consider the mainstream comic market back in the day, mm -hmm. the bottom totally fell out. Right. Uh, the best example you can find of that is if you go get any DC comic from 1976 or 1977, mm -hmm. they had this big two-page spread of all the awesome new comics coming out. It was that idea that, that mainstream was starting to collapse. DC was planning this whole big swath of new books to counteract that, but it didn't come to pass because they, they weren't making any money. The books' sales were halving like every month. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you had um, the undergrounds from the 60s that had, they'd sort of burnt themselves out, but they had led to what would become the independent market because you had this audience that they grew up reading a lot of the Marvel during the 60s because when Marvel started, they were aiming for what would be considered an older audience. Mm 
Right. And that was part of why the continuity was a big thing. It wasn't a big deal prior. And they tried right. they, they tried to have their books set more in the real world. And you had this older audience, and a lot of that was what the independents were drawing from. Uh, right. Plus, independents were drawing from the counterculture a great deal. But when that right. when, when that fizzled in the 70s, so did they. But you had a few people that had shown that you could do comics for an older for an older audience. And that led mm-hmm. that led to stuff like uh, Warp, who did Elf Quest, was the first right. independent company because they published pretty much entirely on their own. It was mostly just Richard and Wendy Peeney. And there was another one. It was a uh, shoot like Star Quest. It was Star Something. And if you read like the old Charlton comics or the old Gold Keys, you'd see like a half page ad for it. Right. And that was another independent comic. That was uh, somebody else was putting that out. And again, it was this idea of aiming books for an older audience. Okay. Um, what had happened as the, 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 the culture shifted and the counterculture started dying out, you had the counterculture stores. Right. They used to call them head shops that would sell like mm. your hippie beads. And- <laughs> Right. And things that were totally not meant for smoking marijuana. It's for tobacco. <laughs> no, in no way were those things meant for smoking marijuana. No. And, but they did come in glorious colors and they made good planters for your plants. <laughs> they did, but no, it had nothing to do with weed, man. Nothing to do with weed. Not at all. And for a lot of these stores, the, the, the underground comics that they were carrying were actually selling. Right. And they continued selling those comics. And out of those is where you got like Kitchen Sink Press and Fantagraphic. Right. Companies like that who were dealing with undergrounds because those head shops became the first comic book stores. Really? I didn't know that, actually. Yeah, and that was because these guys had their own distributions set up. They couldn't sell to the newsstands. They weren't part of, like, the newsstand marketing. Right. They were marketing their own books. And they were market selling look pop basically just printing them up and dropping them off at these these little hippie shops right so they continued doing that oh. and that was why comic book stores as we know them started in the late 70s the very late 70s and into the 80s um i don't know if you'd remember but i remember you'd walk into a comic book store and you wouldn't buy a marvel comic there you wouldn't buy Archie. They were for the books that you couldn't get anywhere else. I, hmm. This isn't... I vaguely remember that, but for me, I, as a kid, I was still very much focused on Marvel and DC. Right. And especially older stuff, because my allowance wasn't that great. Yeah. So, as an end result, I could mostly only focus on the bargain bin stuff, which mostly tended to be Marvel and DC. Yeah. Because you were probably going to, like, magazine stores and that, too. Well, no, I was going to, we have an actual store here in London, it still exists, but it was under different ownership at the time, called the Comic Book Collector. Okay. I mean, I very clearly remember in the early 80s, I would go to the Comic Book Collector because my sister was taking Scottish Highland dance lessons. (laughs) Okay. And yes, it's true, I'm outing my sister, but luckily (laughs) I don't think she'll listen to this show. Um, And... So what would happen is, is, is it was in a building downtown right across from the comic book collector. So while my sister was doing her dance lessons, I'd actually sneak across and go to the comic book collector and like go through the bins and things like that right. and use my allowance. That was how I spent many of my Saturday mornings as a elementary school student right. going into the, uh, those bins and going through them. So I do actually, well, it might even have been the late 70s, not even the early 80s, but it's around, it's around 1980, somewhere around that area. Okay. So I do remember that, but I don't remember, I, I mean, I remember that there were books in the comic book store that were definitely not just Marvel and DC. I do remember that. But I think the comic book collector, the, the store, was clearly catering more towards a mainstream audience. Right. They were trying to be mainstream, and so as an end result, most of what was focused on was Marvel and DC. I do remember going there to get non-Marvel DC stuff when I was a teenager. I do remember that, when I was buying um, Eclipse, 
um, Eternity books. Oh, Comico, of course, yeah, Comico books as well. Okay. Like I kind of got into some of the alternative stuff, it, but that wasn't until I was an older teen right. before I really got into that stuff. Unlike you, of course, who started when you were very young, getting into the alternative stuff right away. Because yeah. we had, um, when I was a little kid, and this would be like mid seventies. Mm-hmm. We had a store downtown. It was a magazine store. Right. But they carried a lot of comics and they carried a lot of back issues. Mm-hmm. This is one of the first times I saw back issues carried anywhere. Mm-hmm. But they they did a lot of the, uh, they brought a lot of the imports over and they carried a lot of the comic magazines, like the old Warren stuff. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the things that when I was a little, little, little kid, I'd get into. Right. I remember seeing those in... Um, magazine stores, yes. odd magazine stores, but not in actual comic shops. Not here in London, anyway. Yeah, we, and that's where I say this place was, it was a newsstand. Because mm-hmm. they also carried all kinds of newspapers from around the world and that. But that was, that was the start. The first comic shop we had in Windsor was a place called Paper Fantasies. Right. And it was one of these places that, you went into and you wouldn't get stuff that you'd find on a spinner rack at Seven Eleven, And this, right. this for me was one of the good things because they carried a lot of the, the, the weirder independence. Like that would be, I want to say 80 or 81. Cause it was just after empire came out. And yes, as a kid, I used star Wars movies to mark different eras of my life. <laughs> well, it's a given that you're using pop culture movies like Star Wars to mark different eras of your life. I mean, that's truly a given. <laughs> I'm among my people. but You are indeed among your people, <laughs> Brother Don. You are indeed among your people. <laughs> okay, so those magazines slash head shops eventually evolved into comic book stores. Right. And, okay. And they were places where you got what what became known as the independents. Mm-hmm. And that was where you got first and Eclipse. Uh, Pacific was another one that was pretty big. At oh, yeah. Apple was another one. Um, yeah, Apple Comics, before they got sued into oblivion by Apple. <laughs> or, Actually, I don't think they lasted long enough to get sued by Apple. No, they, they, they weren't around too, too long. So, but that was, and that was the, the, the early 80s. And then what you had happen was the black and white glut. Mm-hmm. Where... Because the Ninja Turtles took off and made more money than God. Yes, they did. Everybody jumped in doing black and white comics because they figured it was a way to do easy money. Right. And the problem for the stores was uh, they couldn't do returns. Right. On the newsstands, uh, like 7-Eleven that could do returns after a certain, I believe it was two months, you'd right. send books back and you'd get a refund. Mm-hmm. It's like, how have you ever been a paper boy? How newspapers no nope, was never a paper boy i never got into grit oh, that's too bad you missed out on america's newspaper i know i did and i truly regret that but it's a side effect of being canadian i'm afraid <laughs> <laughs> anyway so <laughs> but yep yep I, I avoided being a paper boy okay go good plan and that was that was what happened uh the comic shops had a problem mm-hmm. that they they'd get these lists of new books there were more every month they had no idea what any of them were, if any of them were likely to sell. Mm-hmm. And the comic shop started suffering for it because they get a lot of crap and people would come in and say, oh, there's just more stupid crap this month. Mm-hmm. And the, 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 the whole infrastructure that supported comic shops as a separate entity started to collapse. Right. Uh, they'd stop ordering books. They'd get stuck with a bunch of books that were never going to sell. Mm-hmm. Uh, meanwhile, what had been happening is because of that no return policy, Marvel and, mm-hmm. Marvel and DC had been trying for years to get into the comic shop market. Because uh, some of the older people out there might remember, uh, you started having direct sale only books coming from Marvel and DC. Right, which went straight to the comic shops, yeah. yeah and, and not the newsstands. And that wasn't working because the Marvel and DC were putting out books that weren't that different from their newsstand books. Right. Which people didn't buy at a comic shop. The kind of people that went in there didn't care for that. Uh, Marvel and DC weren't willing to do, I guess, I hate to use the term, mature. But they weren't... Well, hold on. They did try to do mature stuff during the 80s, though. Well, they they did, 
and I mean, that's where whole all the Alan Moore stuff, like Sandman and uh, no, well, Sandman was gaming, but Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. They, I mean, DC tried the hell out of mature stuff back then. They did. You're kind of getting a little ahead of me, though. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay, sorry. Let's go back in time. Okay, sorry. Because I'm going back to the early ones. The stuff they were okay. putting in wasn't that. It wasn't that different. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Mm-hmm. But when the black and white glut hit, the comic shops were looking for for something that they could sell, and they mm-hmm. started getting more Marvel and DC because those were guaranteed sellers. They mm-hmm. they'd been trying to get in, and once once they got that foothold, that's when you started seeing like uh, DC put out what became Vertigo, mm-hmm. yeah, which was ostensibly aimed at a more and again I hate the term but a more mature reader. Right. Uh, they put things out like The Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Marvel kind of farted around with stuff, but they never they never separated their books like DC did. Well, they sort of did. I mean, I remember there were the Marvel graphic novels. Yeah. and Which, if you go back, you'll discover they did like 200 of them or something. They were putting out like one a month for a while. Yeah. At least, and those were meant to more. Those were meant for a more mature audience. Many of them, they were, and there was also the uh, if you remember the Marvel Super Specials, right? Which were like magazine sized. Oh yes, I remember those. Yeah, and those those they had been doing for the newsstand. Like that that wasn't something that they considered quite apart from their line, right? Um, but it, it wasn't until you got to like after the black and white glut that they started doing stuff specifically for comic shops. Mm-hmm. And what ended up happening, as you mentioned, the speculators came in and I remember exactly when they did. And this is why I think overall they were bad for the comic industry. Okay. Cause I can remember it was the Punisher getting his own book. Ah, uh, yes, I do remember that. Yes. And and what what did what did it in what 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 it was is on what must have been a slow news day. CNN did a big story about the Punisher getting his own book because he was this big anti-hero. Yeah, and and that was like radical from their perspective. It was, and I remember the interview because that was what what the the writer had said during the interview is no, and he doesn't just fight supervillains; he goes after like white collar crime and blah blah blah. Yep. But the gist of the article was that now that he got his own book, his earlier appearances were worth more money. Right. And the gist of the article was old comics are worth money. And that was why all of a sudden you had the speculators like, oh, I remember it overnight come in. Mm-hmm. And because they were looking for the guaranteed investments that were going to appreciate. Right. They looked for the bigger names. And that was why Marvel and DC really became what you got at a comic shop because people come in looking for the old issues that were valuable. Right. And they would come in and hoard the, the, the books that they thought would later become valuable. And, uh, the next one was a ghost rider. Yes. They did, I do remember that. And they did the eighties ghost rider series. I think that was the first book that people would order 20 copies of. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was that idea that they wanted the sure, investment i got it because i was curious everyone was talking about it so i bought a copy i've still got one somewhere i'm sure it's worth all the 20 cents right now yeah something like that yeah and then that led to the problem of of what a friend of mine wayne used to refer Mm -hmm. to as the designer comic okay where you had names like i remember during the late 80s john byrne was god Yes, yes, he was. And it used to aggravate me because he wasn't, I didn't think he was that good. He didn't Mm -hmm. suck, but he wasn't that great because you had guys like Bernie Wrightson was still in comics, Mm -hmm. Timothy Truman, uh, Dave Stevens, and these guys got very little attention, but John Byrne, he was awesome! Even though John Byrne tends to draw the same five characters. Not even. Over and over. Not here, you're right, not even. Everybody has he, the same face, male or female. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. I I don't think he was always like that, but after a certain point, I guess he's kind of the original anime artist in some way. I mean, he's 
you know, he's just sticking different hair on the same same person over and over again. Yeah, but at it, least after a certain point. Anime guys change the eyes, so he's not even. Oh, that's true. <laughs> okay, that's true. He's not even their level. But but that was the thing, and I remember like for me because I wasn't a superhero fan, mm-hmm. it felt like this was being pushed on me. Right. And but it was this idea that he was a known name. He mm-hmm. did some decent stuff with the books they gave him. He was reinvigorated. Frank Miller was another one mm-hmm. that he did daredevil stories that didn't suck by turning them into like noir detective stories. Right. And everybody went crazy. And then that name started selling more books. And right. And where I say the problem came in was that that took the focus out of content. Right. And you had the beginning of, um, books being made to be collector's items. Mm -hmm. Like the 80s saw the advent of the non-event because Crisis made a lot of money. Yes, it did. It made a ton of money. And then shortly thereafter, Marvel did Secret Wars, which was Crisis Light and ultimately didn't matter come the end of the story. And very, very shortly, Marvel and DC were doing, well, at least Marvel was doing yearly events, yeah. especially with the X-Men and their other books. Yeah. And they were all like non-events. They were things that didn't didn't really matter. Like I remember what next was like Fall of the Mutants, where they'd introduce some Morlock you never heard of and then kill them next issue. Yep. And that was Fall of the Mutants. Yeah. And then Inferno, where... I think... It followed the mutants in Inferno for my generation, anyway, our generation, I think was a point where a lot of people stopped reading the X-Men. Yeah. I think that's the point where a lot of people are like, wow, this has just become, yeah, these non-event, pointless comics. It's just, I'm Wolverine, I'm going to fight, yep. and I'm, <laughs> we'll beat stuff up, but nothing will ultimately change, so why am I reading this? Yep. And then that was a consequence of what you had happen earlier. Mm-hmm. That and this is why I hate the term mature because when you say mature, people think gratuitous violence and boobs everywhere. <laughs> but well, that's the HBO definition of mature. Well, yeah, but a mature mind is interested in different things and it sees the world differently. Mm-hmm. And that's why, and and I believe we we talked about this not that long ago. Mm-hmm. That was why, as you had them gravitating to what they called mature. You right. were losing readers because the fans were getting older and they were going, oh, this is just more of the same stuff I've been reading for a long time. And then they were just sort of dropping off. And the new people coming in were speculators. And what was happening was the industry took off, but it wasn't because mm-hmm. anybody was reading these books. It was because people were buying multiple copies. Right. And that culminated in the uh, the 90s. Mm-hmm. Where you'd get like uh, Jim Lee's X Men number one sold a million copies, right? But not because a million people bought it and read it was because a hundred thousand people bought ten copies and put them all away. Exactly. And then that's and another comic that's probably only worth twenty cents today. Oh yeah, none of the '90s stuff is worth anything. And I I worked in the comic shop in the early mm-hmm. '90s, right? And I can remember the absolute frenzy for some of these things. Mm-hmm. Like we'd get a book in on Friday and by Sunday it would be selling for 50 bucks. That's insane. It was. And and that was the time because it was the culmination of the designer comics of the 80s. And Well, hold on. Okay. I assume that you mean that literally, that it would go Friday to Sunday. It could literally be three bucks on Friday and 50 bucks on Sunday. Yep. You, you literally mean that. Yep. Just, to, just Paul, you're not exaggerating. This, that's not hyperbole. Nope. Okay. Walk me through for a moment here the evolution of how that exactly happened. I don't, I don't know if you can recall. If you can't recall, that's okay. Oh, I can recall. But, but you know, okay. So it arrives. It goes on sale on Friday. What's the? Yeah. How does that happen? How? What happens in those intermediate steps? Well, what would happen is. Uh... And the book that, that ultimately did it and killed the, the, the North American comic industry was The Death of Superman. Right. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Because Superman didn't sell. Right. Nobody cared. Nobody reserved the books. Uh, comic shops mm-hmm. might get a couple of copies, just obligatory. Right. What's Superman? Yeah. yeah. Um, they started The Death of Superman, and again, there was a big article all over all the news networks but it 
that came out a couple of issues in. Mm-hmm. And that's why if you look like the first appearance of Doomsday, I believe, is still worth around 30 bucks or so. And it's because they weren't printing as much of the, the books as they did later because I think they still weren't sure this was going to take off. And the fans didn't care. But once they cared, every death of Superman, remember, speculators were your predominant comic fans at that mm-hmm. time. Right. So they'd go nuts. They'd be like, I got to get the next issue. And you'd order, say, 20 copies for the store, and you'd get 10 because the distributor didn't have enough of them. Right, because everyone wanted, like, 50 copies, yeah. Yeah, and nobody nobody really expected this to be, it was going to be another comic book non-event. Mm-hmm. But you'd get that, and the comics would come in, and the, the guy, Todd, who ran the place I worked, was a super mm-hmm. savvy business guy. And when he ordered uh, them, he kind of thought something like this might happen, not to the degree that it did. Right. So he'd put away a few store copies. Mm-hmm. And the books would come in, they'd come into all the comic shops, and they'd sell out right away on Friday. Right. And then all day Saturday and into Sunday, you'd have the people looking to, to, to get as many of these as they could. So the book would come in itself for like three bucks Friday. Saturday morning, you'd get phone calls. It'd be like, oh, I'm looking for, for the death of Superman part, blah, blah, blah. And the the store had a couple put away so i say yeah we've got them but they're like 10 bucks each oh buy mm-hmm. them meanwhile they're going for like even more in, in other places right and if you sat on them for a couple of months when wizard would come out and would list them they'd be listing at like 30 bucks and it was mm-hmm. super hot you get 20 people coming in on monday going i gotta get this one i missed it you'd be like, oh, i got one here but it's 40 bucks okay i'll buy it and yeah, every, right. everybody just went insane. Huh. And then a lot of... Truly a speculator's market. Yeah, and a lot of the stores that were okay following in because during the 80s when they had opened, they got like the crap kicked out of them by the the uh, the black and white glut. Mm-hmm. And then with um, like the, the non-events. Right. <clears throat> and remember at that time too, this was when everybody was short, trying to shore up distribution. Mm-hmm. So uh, was it Marvel was trying to buy mm-hmm. Diamond, who was the big distributor? They eventually did, didn't they? Yeah, I think it was Marvel. And then DC... I, it was Marvel, yeah. Because DC bought the other one. And... Yeah, there was Diamond, and oh, what was the other one? I don't remember what their name was. Was it Capital? I think it was. I think you're right. Because there, yeah. there used to be a bunch. Mm-hmm. Because if you go back again the early 80s for the Independence... Mm-hmm. It was basically companies that are acting as intermediaries or companies did their own distribution mm-hmm. or their magazine company because there was like probably 20 different ones. Right. And then by the end of uh, the 80s, there was four. And then going into the 90s, it got down to like two. Yes, it did. And then I don't even – did we get below two? Did we actually get to one at one point? I think we might have. I kind of lost interest by the late 90s because I didn't... Well, I had two, so that's why I don't really remember, yeah, I'm afraid. And I went back to get my books at a bookstore. <gasps> I know. Philistine. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. But that was the, the speculator's market. Mm-hmm. And, and it tanked the industry because the company started milking it. And anybody who was a comic reader in the 90s remembers like, you know, 15 mm-hmm. variant hollow foil glow in the dark covers. I do remember that. Yes, I remember them. And everybody is hoarding and everybody is hoarding and everybody is hoarding. And literally overnight, the bottom fell out. Well, yeah, because eventually people realized that everyone had giant hordes of these things and they'd be worth nothing eventually. Well, yeah, and what happened was they did the uh, Reign of the Supermen where four different Supermen came back. Mm -hmm. And that was the the sales of those books was kind of starting to peter out. Right. And a lot of people, because at this point, everybody was an industry insider. Right. Everybody knew what was happening and a lot of guys started to sell their death mm-hmm. of Superman books. And there wasn't... I can't help yet. but wonder... Sorry to interrupt. I can't help but wonder if the internet was actually playing a role in that too. Um, in the early 90s and mid-90s, because remember the internet or the World Wide Web properly as we know it, starts about 93. Yeah. Okay, so you've got this slow build-up. 
but by the late 90s, we're getting, um, well, we already had the listservs and the other online chat areas where mostly geeks were talking to each other, but at least there were starting to be places where people could compare notes. And I have to wonder if those places where the people can compare notes, blogs, and websites were starting to actually have an effect on the comic market, and they helped make everyone realize just how many of these copies were going around and how pointless this all was. Looking back, I think you're sort of right, but I don't think it affected comics as much as it did the next speculator's market. Ah, uh, okay. Which was action figures. Really? Yeah. See, action figures are not my area, so I wasn't aware. I guess I was kind of aware that for a little while there was a bit of a action figure speculators market. But okay, so oh, there wasn't let's hear bit. about that then. Well, it was it was the same idea mm-hmm. uh, as the as the comic thing because the comics were were petering out, mm-hmm. and if you remember by the mid nineties, Marvel and DC and sometimes Image were trying to market their their product. Right. Um, Image is what killed the comic industry Mm -hmm. and it's it's not their fault but it was again the ultimate realization of the designer comic Mm -hmm. that people would buy anything with jim lee's name on it right and so they eventually expanded out if i remember right into action figures mostly spawn figures although if i remember right given their playability in action figures (laughs) would be the better term for them and i think we called them that back in the day too i'm I'm sure we did (laughs) And and it was true because uh, it Todd McFarland is the one who did it because he wanted to market mm-hmm. the hell out of Spawn, mm-hmm. and that's why he got into the action figures, and that kind of started the collectible action figure market because they sold them in comic shops, mm-hmm. and people would see oh the, there's these th- other things based on these characters, and you got a big speculator market, and they did limited releases, and then that mm-hmm. took off. Mm-hmm. And so, so that took off just as the comic market was collapsing then. Yeah, that's where okay. all the speculators went because they saw that the comics were failing, but the action figures were a big thing. Ah, and, okay. And then that was, you started to see, uh, one of the weird things that happened with the action figures was when that started becoming popular, mm-hmm. they didn't differentiate between, say, collector's figures and actual toys a kid would play with. Right. Because there's all kinds of stories about, say, the mid-90s, late 90s mm-hmm. of, of like, you know, the quote-unquote comic book nerd types stocking Toys R Us and waiting for them to open so they can buy 15 of whatever it was that came out. I do remember those stories. I also remember, you know, horrified parents and their kid would come rushing up to them and tell them they wanted to buy Hellspawn. Yeah. The action figure. And the parents would be absolutely hor- horrified that uh, this is being sold in Toys R Us. Yep. yep. And I the, do remember that. And stories of like grown people fighting with kids for, for toys and stuff. Well, you know, that's what that's why Jingle All the Way is a true story, right? Well, yeah, and that's why that came out when it did, because it was capitalizing on toy that people would punch each other out for. Yeah, I was going to say, Jingle All the Way was based more on the idea of, like, the Cabbage Patch, Beanie Baby, whatever, as you say, the toy everyone was crazy for every year. Yeah. I don't think he, I don't, if I recall right, he was looking for, like, a Turbo Man action figure, but it wasn't exactly an action figure, because the thing was freaking huge. Yeah. It was more of a giant action doll, really. Well, six of one, half dozen of the other. When you look at Jingle All the Way, again, it was this idea, Mm -hmm. though, that it was seen as a plaything. That's true. And it wasn't until you got, like, Toy Fair. Mm -hmm. Toy Fair was a big part of making action figures a collectible. I remember, yes. And then that went on, and that was just like the comics. And then by the 2000s, it had the same problem that comics did, where the bottom fell out, because everybody realized, I'm buying a thousand of these, and so is everyone else, and it's going to be worth nothing. Exactly. And it's another case, if you go on, like, eBay, you can find, like, the McFarland figures that I remember going for astronomical f- amounts mm-hmm. for nothing. Yep. There's too many of them. I'm sure there are a few of them that are probably actually still valuable today, but the vast majority are worth nothing. Yeah, and they're not worth, like I say, that was still, I was still at, like, the comic shop, and it was a frenzy. Mm-hmm. It was, it was insane how, how, how desperately they were looking for stuff and what they'd pay for certain things. 
I mean, you missed your opportunity. You should have been asking for bribes. That would have been a great time for corruption. <laughs> sure, I'll set that aside for you if you give me a little extra cash. <laughs> no, the, the store wasn't that big. It was right. It was basically just Todd and I showed up a couple of days a week. And no, Todd was good at that himself. Like I said, he was the, the ultimate businessman. Right. He, he was damn good at like frighteningly good at it. And If I recall right, Todd was also rather fond of his guns. So I can understand <laughs> why you might not have wanted to do that at the uh, comic store. <laughs> Naz is a better shot than he was. It was all good. Oh, okay. <laughs> we're, we're, good. we're good then. Yeah. Okay, so we've got the toy market, and the toy market would carry on, what, into the early 2000s? Early mid? Uh, yeah, I'd probably say by the the early. Okay, early 2000s. It had kind of fallen out. Yeah. And then was there another speculator market of the um, nerdly items that uh, actually replaced that? Because I know we didn't... I mean, comics kind of came back, but I don't think we had a speculator market like we had before, though. No, what happened with uh, with the two of them, because I want to I get to your point, because I don't think there is another nerdly speculator market, but they're desperately trying to make one. Okay. But um, comics bounce back, mm -hmm. but they bounce back as reading material. Right. And what did that, I think, was the Japanese stuff. Interesting. And it was because they they uh they did they got it when they brought it over, mm -hmm. they aimed it at a younger audience. You got kids involved. Uh one of the things that killed comics when the speculators came in is you weren't getting a new generation of, of, of fans. Right. It was all older people. The kids didn't read them, and then when the Japanese stuff came out, that was something the kids got into. Well, yes. I mean, they're they're very kid friendly because that's what they're meant for in Japan. They're meant for kid reading material. Well, most of them, anyway. Well, they are. And when they they brought them over, the first was like the monthly Shonen Jump. They right. they brought stuff a younger person would enjoy. But they also oh. did the trick that they brought a lot of different stuff. Yes, I oh, one small quibble. If I recall right, there was already a substantial manga market, even at bookstores and such, and stuff coming out before if Shonen Jump launched. They didn't launch into a new market. I mean, monthly Shonen Jump America, I think if I remember right, launched several years after the manga boom had really started. Well, I th they weren't really taking a risk. You're you're right, but it wasn't exactly a boom. Okay. Because they started in the early 80s translating Japanese comics and bringing them over. And, yep. And they always had a fan base, but it wasn't one of the bigger ones. And when they brought the, the monthly Shonen Jump over, mm -hmm. it took off because you had, like, uh, the Yu-Gi-Oh! cartoon, uh, the Pokemon cartoon, mm -hmm. which kids liked. Right. They brought kid-friendly stuff over. Right. And then they brought a variety of it. So they brought comedy and they brought, they did the soap opera stuff fairly early. Mm -hmm. And they even brought sports dramas and, and things that we would never at that point have thought to do a comic book of here. And that brought more people in. It wasn't just like, you know, the 14 year old adolescent male power fantasy that is a superhero. Mm -hmm. They got female readers. They got like, male readers that weren't concerned about penis size. Like they got all kinds, they got normal people reading comics. Right. And then that's what, what made it so popular. And then for like a decade and a half or so, that was North America's comic industry. Yes. And I, okay. I agree with that. Yes. And that's why when you look now, um, mm -hmm. like a Marvel or a DC book has a print run of like 85,000 copies which is really low, especially compared to the 80s or 90s. Mm -hmm. But I think that number is more realistic to 80s and 90s readership levels. Well, I'm not quite sure if I agree with that. I mean, I think in the early to mid 80s, if I remember right, you can correct me on this, I think there was a bit of a comics boom that happened, but it was a reader's boom. And then, yeah, the Punisher thing came out, as you as you talked about. I do remember some of this. And I remember there being a bit of a dip in the late 80s, 
And then things kind of took off again in the early 90s, eventually leading, of course, to the image boom and everything else that happened there. And I remember in the 90s, I remember, you know, them trumpeting million book print runs. But in the early 80s, I think they did still have fairly substantial numbers. I mean, more than today anyway. Oh, much. Like um, in the early 80s, a book that had print runs of like 250,000 copies would be canceled. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I remember even in the early 80s when people were just buying them to read, I think X-Men was still selling like half a million copies. Oh, it, it was. And, and this is where I think the speculator thing, um, to be generous, we'll say mixed blessing, mm -hmm. um, I think realistically was bad for Marvel and DC, good for the rest of us. Because people were. The, the, the X-Men was actually, when Claremont took over, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It gained readership. People were buying it yeah. to read. Yes. But then when the, the speculators moved in and comics kind of stopped becoming reading material, and mm -hmm. when you had those old fans who were readers move on, you weren't, br right. you weren't bringing the new ones in. Hmm. That, that makes sense. That by that time, comic books weren't something that kids would read. They were what dad obsessed about and put in plastic bags and went ape shit over if you dared to like take them out and look at them. You got fingerprints on my issue of Spawn number three. It's no longer mint. No. <laughs> exactly. And and then that kept the kids away. Yes. And then again, when the Japanese stuff came out, it wasn't comic books. It was manga. Which in everybody's mind meant, oh, that's something different. So the kids got into it and made it their own. And that's why, like, the old school fans hate the Japanese stuff. And Many of them do. That's indeed true. Yeah, and that's why I think when the speculators left in the 90s, everything tanked because you hadn't brought in mm -hmm. very many new readers. And it was because they got squeezed out because it wasn't something that young people would, would think to get into. That makes sense. Okay, that makes sense. And so you're suggesting then that that's ultimately what killed or what helped to kill the American comic book fan base. Yeah. Okay. That I could take as an example of why the speculator market was kind of bad for the industry. Okay, I could agree with that then. Hmm. Okay, I can see your point. And then it worked out good for comics in general because with mm -hmm. the Japanese stuff, things moved to bookstores. Right. And because you had exposure to a potential larger audience you got a larger variety of stuff and and i think that's ultimately been very good as you said i mean the fact that i can go and find a huge variety of comic books and i'll put that in quotes in my local uh chapters or indigo depending on which it's calling itself this week right. <laughs> is awesome yeah i think that that's a wonderful thing because i can read whatever I want, and whether it's Japanese or American, independent, Marvel, DC. I mean, in a lot of ways, Marvel and DC do still take up a huge amount of shelf space, yeah. but there's a lot of other stuff mixed in there. Yeah. Old stuff, new stuff, and people are being more experimental. And you can't because it brings in people who would normally not look at a comic book. And ultimately, that's what comic books need. You need variety. Yes. I agree. And you need fans who are not comic book fans, but are actual more casual readers. Yeah, then that's that's exactly it. Mm. Emphasis on reader. Emphasis on, yeah, people who are reading it as a form of entertainment, not buying it as a form of uh, a speculative commodity. Yeah. Okay. So earlier you mentioned something about how the industry is trying to create a speculator's market what did you mean by that oh that was the the third one mm -hmm. um this may come as a surprise to some of the people out there but i am mm -hmm. a huge fan of tabletop role-playing games i know St color me surprised stunned silence so for for years i've been trying to finish off sets of some of the older games mm -hmm. and uh use the example of torg that uh west end put out back in the 90s a game that almost no one listening to this has probably actually heard of or played. Oh, probably not. But about a... Right up there with Space 1889. Oh, well, yeah. Which is another one that this effect I've noticed is happening to. Oh, ties in nicely. Go on. 
Because Torg books, you could go on eBay and, like I said, you bought them by the pound. You'd spend ten bucks for eight books, because there, there, there was no big collectors market for role playing games. Mm-hmm. There's a secondary market because there were people like me looking to finish sets and that still enjoyed things and all that. Right. Um, but it wasn't like this is valuable mm-hmm. until less than a year ago. Mm-hmm. Where I've noticed like a lot of old game books that you would get eight for 10 bucks are now listing at like 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 40 bucks. Wow. And, and you can see that like Torg is one, uh, base mm-hmm. 1889. Some of the books you'll see listing for astronomical prices. Interesting. Okay. And there's a bunch of the old one. Now I say listing and I say they're trying to make a collector's market because they don't seem to sell at those prices. Ah, well, people assume that there's some nostalgia market, right? I mean, the Gen Xers, that would be our generation, have money at this point, and some of them probably look fondly upon some of those games and would like to own a copy again. See, and I, th- I think that's what they're banking on. Mm-hmm. But I th- That's the theory, anyway, yeah. yeah. But I think gaming works a little different because I think it's still a fan market. Right. That people would buy the book not to, to, to as an investment, or even necessarily nostalgia, but because there's an intent to use it. Yeah, they actually want to play it. And then topping that, mm-hmm. a lot of the old games are available now as PDFs. Yes, that's one of the things that's going to kill the value of games. I mean, why should I pay 40 bucks for a copy of Space 1889 when even, what, probably drive through RPG probably has a download of the PDF of it for like three bucks that's indexable, searchable. I mean, I can print it off if I need to, etc. See, now that's, that's a sticking point, though. Okay. Because I've noticed, uh, this is the same thing a lot of comic book companies are trying to go PDF, mm-hmm. but the prices are still high. Okay. So a game book that I, that'll cost me 30 bucks for a book... Mm-hmm. A lot of times I can go get the PDF for 20 bucks. Right. And, well, that's the result of companies trying to keep it artificially high. Well, it, it's that, and I think um, a lot of them don't know what to do with them. Mm, I can see that, too. Like the, the, the whole digital publishing thing, I think, is lost on a lot of the, the bigger companies. Well, it's a combination, right? I mean, of course, I'm more familiar with like the ebook industry, but I know the mainstream publishers in the ebook industry, they are stuck in a kind of trap where they're selling their paper books for, let's say, 14 bucks, even for like a paperback, and then like 30 bucks for a hardcover, for example. And they desperately want people to buy them, and they, but they would probably be happy to sell ebooks, but the problem is, they can't have the ebooks undercutting the paperback sales. Yeah. So they can't sell the ebooks for, say, like four bucks or something like that, like most indie publishers can. Because if they did, they'd be afraid it would cannibalize the sales of the hardcover and paperbacks. Yeah, I can see that. And so, at least in their case, that's why if you go on and you go looking for, say, the new Stephen King book, for example, you'll see that the ebook version, the Kindle version, for example, will probably be just as much as the paperback. And occasionally can even be more expensive than the paperback, believe it or not. Because the truth is, they actually hate the ebook industry for the most part, <laughs> wish it would go away, right. and are only putting it up because they figure, well, I guess some fools will still buy this thing, right? Yeah, I could see that. With games, I think it is a little bit different, though. I think with games... Okay, we've got a couple factors involved. I think one of the factors involved is that in a lot of cases with old games, like let's say um, Space 1899, I don't think the company that published that still exists. I think its catalog was bought by some other company. Helioscope Industries. Okay, there you go. Um, And then that company has to recoup their investment. Yeah. So they can't just start selling like two buck copies of Space 1889 as PDFs because they've already you know shelled out thousands, maybe tens of thousands of dollars for the rights. God help them. So they've got to get it back somehow. So they have to keep the PDF prices high because from their point of view, that's the only way they're going to quickly make their money back. Right. 
And I think that there's a lot of that going on. The sad, truly sad part is, is that pretty much any role-playing game that exists or has existed, you can find torrents of <laughs> on the various you know, torrent pirate sites. At least I've heard. I, of course, never have done it <laughs> myself. So you can use those torrent sites to get them for free. So a lot of gamers just do that. I mean, yeah. it's amazing that the gaming industry really does sell any any books anymore anyway because everyone just torrents everything right and they get scanned as fast as the actual book comes out by pirates if not um releasing their own pdf version yeah well i i, uh, I think though that saves a lot of companies because now they're not companies they're just like a guy who pu puts his own books up yeah pretty much so they yeah. they don't have a corporate infrastructure to support right I mean, I know with some of the companies, what they're running into is some people are buying the rights or holding on to the rights for old games, and then they're using digital publishing as a way to keep the rights by claiming that they're still they're still in print, right? Because they're still available online. So therefore, the original creators can't get their rights back from the company because they're still in print. Yeah, I could see that. So that's become a fight. I think that fight happened with the game uh, Villains and Vigilantes, if I remember right. I don't know how that's turned out, but I know they were fighting over that. A lot of the fantasy games, unlimited games, yeah, were in that situation where they were sort of in print thanks to like e-published editions, and the person who holds the company rights was claiming that the creators couldn't get their rights back exactly because they were still in print. Yeah. So... Okay, so the gaming market is definitely being hit by um, speculation right now, for better or for worse. Well, it's it's the idea that I don't know if they're they're not hit by it, but somebody's trying really hard to get them hit by it. Well, I think from what I remember and have seen on, it's been a while since I really you know, looked at games on eBay. But even a number of years ago, I do remember that. There are certain games that would go for really high prices. Well, that would list for high prices. Okay, valid point. That would list for high prices. Where they actually sold them or not. Like, Especially, for example, some of the old FASA Star Trek role-playing games. I think actually the modules, for example, and some of the source books, which I could understand are a little bit rarer. They probably only had like 1,000 to 2,000 copies printed of many of them. Yeah. And I've seen some of them go for high prices on eBay. There's a couple of them, I think, that are worth quite a bit, aren't there? There are, but there aren't, because, again, it's the, the, the market's wonky. Mm -hmm. And I think it's to compare it to, uh, to, to the other two examples we use. There's, right. there's no role-playing game Toy Fair magazine or Overstreets right. or Wizard. Right. So, so there's no price guide. Mm -hmm. And you'll see, because... I'm thinking when you mentioned the fast of Star Trek, one mm -hmm. of the books that would go for astronomical amounts was uh, the Dixie Gambit. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. That it would list for like $50 and up. I think I actually have a copy of that somewhere in my archives. Yep, because I just got one off eBay for like $15. Oh, okay, that's good. Which is more than I'd like to pay because I'm a cheap bastard. Mm -hmm. But it's that idea that a lot of these, if you look... Really cheap copies come around eventually. Right. And those are the ones that are selling. But you, mm -hmm. you still see people listing them at huge prices. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, FASA Doctor Who game. Yeah, there would be a rare collector's item. Yeah, there was one adventure that I needed to finish my set. and I never saw it list for under 75 bucks. That does not surprise me in the slightest. They did not print that many copies of that game. No, especially because this is like one of the last ones and it had a low run because sales were down. Yeah, even back in the day, I remember that was actually... A, you could see modules for it, I remember, in the hobby shops, but the actual rule book, the actual source, was actually fairly rare. Yeah, and all, some of the uh, supplements were. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, I'd see it was uh, the City of Gold adventure. Right. And it would list for 75 bucks. Mm -hmm. And these were eBay listings that I had seen up there for like a decade. Wow. Because they didn't sell. Nobody wanted to spend that much. Mm -hmm. And eventually a cheap copy, a cheap copy of everything will come around. That makes sense. But like mm. I say, there's a lot of, it could be um, what one website referred to as the crazy grandma price guide. Okay, what's that? Well, that's where everybody thinks it's old. It must be valuable. <laughs> 
Right. That may, well, yeah, that's, that makes sense. Yeah. And because you don't get a big, people aren't shelling out big bucks for a lot of this stuff. It's not catching on. Hmm. Well, yeah, supply and demand. You have to have a demand. I mean, you can raise the prices all you want, but if no one's buying, there's no point. Yeah, well, it's it's perceived supply and demand. That's very true. But then again, that's what the whole, like, futures speculation market, even in business, is based on, right? Yep. Perceived supply and demand. Yeah, we saw how well that worked out a few years back. Yes, we did. Yeah, 2008 will be remembered for many years. I... Um, on that note, actually, I think we better wrap this up. Okay, um, we're starting to run a little low on time. Okay, since we're talking, since I mentioned futures, what do you think will happen? Will we get another boom of some nerdly um, article of choice or toy of choice, or has the fact that we've created a society based on digital information and so scarcity is really you know a scarce product like a book really isn't that big a deal anymore going to prevent such markets from happening again oh uh, we're well, i think it'll definitely happen it always does right but i think because like you say we're in a post scarcity entertainment world now right those booms will be a lot quicker so they'll Come in, they'll hit, and then they'll be gone maybe in a matter of months or even weeks. Yeah, that it'll be like CNN will do a story about Dungeons and Dragons used to be a book. And it'll be like, oh my god, I have to get all those books. And then for like a month, everybody will, and then it'll all stop because it it's just too easy to find everything. Right, that's true. Well, actually, I think there is a bit of a D&D nostalgia boom going on right now. Um, I was just reading how someone released a Gary Gygax book. Mm -hmm. There was just an article this week in The Atlantic about that. But uh, anyway, um, well, although apparently it has some issues because some of it was, um, how can I put this? Some of it was kind of docudrama level stuff. Okay. Apparently the book it reimagines a few certain scenes that occurred based on eyewitness accounts. So... <laughs> There's definitely been some, you know, we'll call, we call it nonfiction storytelling involved. Let's put it that way. <laughs> okay. About some of the events. But anybody could be worth checking out if you're a D and D fan. But I, I've just been noticing more and more D and D related stuff popping up. Maybe it's again a side effect of fantasy and Game of Thrones and all that being popular right now. It it is, and it's it's again um, post scarcity. Mm -hmm. every version of the game that ever existed, people are putting mm -hmm. new supplements out for. Right. Well, because people are still playing every version of the game. Yep. And that's one of the wonderful things about the post-scarcity society. So I think we're going to have to leave it there. So thanks, Don. That's been a great and incredibly informative uh, discussion, actually, about the speculator market and how it's affected the nerdly arts over the past couple of decades. I was helpful. Yes, I know. Okay, have a cookie. Thanks. Okay, well, good night, folks. Uh, tune in next time when we will once again talk about something related to the nerdly arts. Thanks for listening to the Department of Nerdly Affairs. If you want show notes or to tell us why we're wrong, head on over to ObeyTheDNA.com and join the discussion. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend. And remember, to master the nerdly arts takes time, perseverance, and a whole lot of nachos. Do not be discouraged, for you too can be a light in the darkness. See you next time!